In Hebrews, we're going to kind of bounce forward and backwards. We're not going to touch on everything, uh, but we're going to hit a few areas. Let's, let's start in chapter 8 of Hebrews. We went through the study of, of Bible prophecy. We went through the Old Testament and the, the covenants given to Abraham, to Moses, to David. We looked at the prophecies leading up to the coming of the Messiah. And we find, uh, we get into the New Testament, and Jesus talks about his blood and the new covenant. So we're going to look here in verse 7 of chapter 8. Because the question arises uh, in the hearts of some, and, and there are certainly some theological issues that come out of the discussion of, of Old Covenant New Covenant. Why was it necessary for there to be a New Covenant? What was wrong with the Old Covenant? Are we still under some of the Old Covenant? What, what's, what's the deal with the covenants, as Jerry Seinfeld might say? <laughs> Bad, sorry. <laughs> Let's just go to verse 7. That was, good. That was all right? Yeah, that was all right. Okay. All right. Well, he's, he's Jewish. This is the covenant, so it, it kind of works. <laughs> For if that the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he's saying, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and, and I disregarded them says the Lord for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my law in their minds and write, write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Let's pause there for a moment. And we, so we realize that there, there is an answer given in, in this scripture about the necessity for a new covenant. That the old covenant was given, it was broken by mankind. It was broken by mankind, and, and so a new covenant is coming into place. And we find in the study, in the study of this, that the old covenant does not necessarily replace, the New Covenant does not necessarily replace the Old Covenant, but we see fulfillment in the arrival of the New Covenant. Now why I say that is because the, the provisions and the things that were in that first covenant, the things that they had to do, as you study those, those things point forward to Jesus, who is the giver of this New Covenant. What's just throw out an example of something that was in the Old Covenant. It could be anything at all. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. How did I know that was going to be the first? <laughs> Very good. So sacrifice. Uh, how did they have to sacrifice? Well, once a year they would bring something, depending on what they had done or what they felt like they were required or what they could afford, and they would bring it, and their, their sins would be transferred in. Uh, scapegoat release, how, whichever part of the sacrifice you want to look at, how is that fulfilled? Because we, we know that the, the Old Covenant is not necessarily done away with, but there was fulfillment that happened. How was that sacrifice fulfilled? Anybody can answer? Crucifixion. Yeah, the cross. Uh, we, we find another spot that says that once and for all, Jesus died in made that sacrifice, made atonement for our sin, the fulfillment of that covenant happened. Right? Yes, you're also quiet tonight. You make me nervous when you're quiet. But I get commentary from Larry, so I like that. That's exciting. Well, let's read on there. Verse 11. None of them shall teach his neighbor and and none his brother say, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least, at the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful to, to their unrighteous, and their sins, 
and their lawless deeds I will no more I will no more I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now from this point of the author's writing, the the temple was still in place, right? Sacrifice is happening right up until what happens? Titus, 70 AD, the, about half of the Roman legions surrounded Jerusalem and completely obliterated the city, killed a million and a half people, burned the temple down. Yeah, the practices of the temple are, are gone from that point forward. They're driven off the land by the sword. Rome comes in in a mighty sweep. And what was the common practice, what was their, their spiritual security, is absolutely taken away. As a matter of fact, practicing Jews for these past uh, 2,000 years have had quite a dilemma, not that long, have had quite a dilemma in what do I do with my sin? What do I, what do, I do for my atonement? How, how do I? And so they've, they've made up some man-made things to compensate um, not realizing, because there are blinders on their eyes, which we'll get to in a little bit, that that was done away with, that was made obsolete, or that was fulfilled in Christ, and that there is a provision already laid out for them. So we find in the, in the Old Covenant was a practice of cleansing the outside, before you could approach God for cleansing on the inside. We find that the cross is a reversal of that, that, that scenario. That through the blood of Christ we are cleansed on the inside. Grace cleanses me where I am. And then the work of sanctification changes my behaviors and my outside as an effect. So it's it's a reversal of how things were in the Old Testament in the New. But the, the pieces are still in place. There is still a cleansing that has to happen, and there is still atonement which is made. It's just a fulfillment of that picture in the New. And I love that. You know, everything that we find in the Old Testament, everything that we have studied uh, to this point, has pointed forward to Christ. And we didn't really get into the temple and the sacrifices yet, but when we do, we see all of these all of these objects, all of these rituals, all of these rules have a significant forward arrow pointing to the cross, to Christ, to redemption, and redemption's completion. All right, and let's turn forward to chapter 9 and look at verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. For those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus died once, covered the, the sins of mankind. Now those who are, are holding a part of that salvation are looking forward to his coming. It's almost as if, and I find this, I found this true in my study, that salvation is very much connected to the future of this world and the coming of God. The culmination, uh, it, it, it's, it's one thing, it's one beautiful thing that God has done. You know, we were saved at the cross, we are being saved today, and we will be saved at the completion of all things when restoration comes to this planet. That's an exciting thing. Now, as we read through Scripture, you'll come across this phrase that Jesus died once and for all. Don't make the, the mistake of thinking that that once and for all, that all is, 
is a time word. It's not a people word. Uh, to say that Jesus died once and for all is not necessarily an accurate thing. We know from the, the, the communication in the upper room, the, Lord, the Last Supper, uh, that that blood was for, a to for many. But that phrase, once and for all, is a time phrase. Jesus died once. So there is a practice within the Roman Catholic Church that when they take communion, this is called transubstantiation, when they take communion, Jesus in the physical dies once again that very day. The bread in their mouth becomes his flesh, and the wine or the grape juice in their mouth becomes his blood, atoning once again for their sins. Now, does that fit with Scripture? No, no. He would have to die over no, yeah. and over again. Dying over and over and over again. Uh, but yet, yeah, that's that's the practice, and, and actually, the bread is worshipped. I, I actually just saw on eBay they were selling a Eucharist in a gold-colored monument. There's a the little bread worshipped as an idol. But no, Scripture says that he died once. He covered the cost of sin once with his life, in the same way that Adam died once and sin continued because his life and death didn't cover the debt that sin required, Jesus died once and covered the sin for all who will be saved. I try to say that carefully because I don't want to leave room for universalism that suggests that, that His grace covers everybody and everybody eventually is going to work through their issues and everyone is going to get saved. That doesn't fit with the whole teaching of Scripture. So I don't want to leave you with room for that idea. All right. There's also a little clause in this Scripture. In verse 20, I'll read that again. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. That next phrase, to those who eagerly wait for Him. He will return. Uh, he is returning for those who are looking for him, but there's also this connection between salvation and anticipation of his coming that should be in place. And I find it very unnerving when I run into Christians who claim salvation but really share no interest in the coming of Christ or the kingdom of God or the future that God's laid out. That's, that's very very strange and it, it really is rooted in, in ignorance and I say that as kindly as I can but this is what Paul warned us about of these things I don't want you to be ignorant I want you to understand that these things are connected these things are important that there's a, a crown a crown of reward for those who are looking for his coming it's something that we are supposed to have in our life, naturally. John, did you have a comment? No. Oh, apologies. Where were you at? Oh, sorry, yes. We are in Hebrews. And uh, let's go ahead and turn to chapter 1. We're going to bounce over there. We were in, in chapter 8, um, talking about the new covenant in verse 7. So in chapter 1, Chapter 1, looking in verse 8. Here we have the description. And really through these first chapters, we begin to get this description of the superiority of Jesus and the new covenant and his priesthood over the old. It says here in verse 8, But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. 
Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. We look up above that, we see uh, in verse 6, it says that the angel, all the angels of God worship Him. We see the superiority of, of Jesus. We see the, the superiority uh, of his, his covenant. In this, in this new covenant, the focus is not at all on your ability to fulfill the covenant. It's not in your ability to cleanse yourself. It's not in your ability to prepare an animal for sacrifice. It's not in your ability. Um, it is in Christ. It is in the work of the cross. Though there are still things that he, he commands and compels us to do, that is a minor, and he is the major. He is the supreme. He is the superior part of the new covenant. And that's extremely important because we understand that that was the flaw in the old covenant. That's what we got from chapter 8. It's saying that the, the, really the flaw in the old covenant was not necessarily the old covenant, but the people that couldn't keep the old covenant. The old covenant was useful, and it pointed us to our need for a Savior. The law is still useful in pointing us to our need for a Savior. But we realize that in our capacity, we fail. We have more failures. We have uh, broken lives, broken thought processes, broken emotions. Everything about us, every natural thing about us, points us to the fact that we can't make it without Christ. If we're honest with ourselves, we can be dishonest and... <coughs> But if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that these flaws within us, even our, even, our, even our bodies that are falling apart, point us to our need for God. And that's a fantastic thing. It may not seem like a fantastic thing when you're having this struggle in your mind, or you're having, having this emotional pull or, or conflicts in life. But understand that our daily life, this 80 years, these 70 years that we're here, these 105 years, whatever, this is not the supreme. He is the supreme. His plan is the supreme. His coming kingdom and the completion of our salvation, that is, that's the highlight, that's the feature. Everything in our life should point us back to the main feature. The one great mistake we've made in this culture, this age that we're in, is we have such overdeveloped lives. We have such overdeveloped structure, and such overdeveloped entertainment, and overdeveloped comforts and luxuries uh, that we're so distracted. Most of the people in this world today don't even recognize that there's anything supremely above them. And if they do, they get it wrong. So, the first covenant was beautiful in that it pointed us in our brokenness to our need for the new covenant and the Savior who provided that covenant. Let's turn forward to chapter 4 and verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and, and those whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again he designates a certain day, saying, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, it has been said, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Who is he talking about? Who has hardened hearts? Who, who didn't hear? The nation of Israel. The, the, the Jews who, who hardened their hearts against, who rejected Christ. 
they have to come into the kingdom of God, the, the, the millennial kingdom, the same way that we do. And this is a very important point. There are some who believe that the Jew covenants are working at the same time and that the Jews are still under their old covenant and that we're under the new covenant, and that's not the case. Scripture is telling us that the Jews must come in the same way that you and I have, and that's through Jesus. There's one way, and it's in the new covenant, and it's in his blood and his grace. There are, there are teachers out there who would suggest that the Jews are covered by their practices, and the old covenant covers them, but that doesn't fit with all of Scripture. So... Israel will come to Christ the same way that you and I did when their eyes are opened. And though nationally Israel is blind, we know that individually people's eyes can be opened. There are, there are Christian Jews, there are Christian Israelites, there are people in Israel who are being saved and are, are recognizing Jesus as their Messiah. So as we talk about of uh, Israel's blindness, that God blinded them because they rejected Jesus. We also have to understand that while God deals with the nation, He also deals with individuals, and that there, there are some that, that are saved. All right. It should be said too, Greg, that these are the ones that witnessed firsthand God taking them out of Egypt and all of what God did. Yep. And they still rejected him. Yeah, these are the ones who have the prophets sent to them. These are the ones that heard, heard first. They, they, they witnessed firsthand. Absolutely. The, and the, in the church age, we see that the new covenant was given to them first. You know, the, the Christian church, the Gentile church, uh, we didn't really see expanding. Well, in Acts till chapter 8, we see, you know, first it was delivered to the Jews. And then it was given to the Gentiles. So yeah, that is a great point. I agree. It, yeah. it is an important distinction to, to distinct between to to distinguish between um, what we would use the word salvation. A theologian would say justification and being chosen. You can be. I mean, it's exactly what's happening right here. Actually, in Hebrews four, as we're talking about a, a large group of people that were God's chosen people, in the sense that they all. You know, God chose to take them out of Egypt, and they went to the Red Sea, and, and all. You know, we know that story, and and then you know this is about how some of them, even though even though God chose them, and even though they were His chosen people, and they left Egypt and went through the Red Sea, they ended up what? They they died in the wilderness in the forty years of wandering around. So there is a you can be chosen in some sense, and yet not saved. <laughs> that's that's yeah. Yep. That's where you'll get real yeah. confused if you don't have that distinction mm -hmm. in your mind. Well, to see firsthand what God did and then still choose not to follow, I mean, wow. Sure. Yeah. Well, and we've seen 1,900 years of, of blindness over the house of Israel where that's a hard thing to think about. For all of these generations, they have four children, being the chosen people, just as John said, and dying without Christ. Many, many, many people uh, because of the blindness of their hearts. Yet at the same time, we know that God's Spirit deals with the individual and there are some who've come uh, to the saving knowledge of Christ. Uh, let's look down in verse 9 of that chapter. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. There, there remains a rest. There remains a a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There's a, a time coming when they their work and their labor and their conflict is going to cease, and that's a future thing. And so we have to understand this applies both to Israel, and also we have references for the church. It says that there is coming, even though there's conflict today, even though there's hardship today, there's coming a time of rest. There's coming a time of peace. There's coming a time of restoration. And having that hope within you, having that knowledge within you, that this conflict I'm in is not it. This is not, even, even if your entire life is hard and harsh, this is not it. This, this is a period 
of my existence, but this is not the totality of my existence. There's coming a place in my life where the peace of God is going to reign. There's coming a, a place where, where labor is going to cease and there is that Sabbath rest coming. Just as in creation, there were those six days of labor, those six days of preparation, those, those six days in which activity happened and then a cease on that seventh day, it says God rested. We have that promise that there is a period coming where this constant conflict for Israel and this separation from their God is going to end and there will be a unity with God. There will be peace in their land. There will be restoration. There will be healing. There will be blessing and abundance. And we already today, for the nation of Israel, see beginnings of incredible blessing. Just since they've come back on the land, we've talked about this, that, that the land itself has been developed in the desert to be a great producer of produce, uh, that their technological advancements, their advancements of knowledge is a blessed gift of God. And they're still in this period of blindness. So that tells us, that gives us a little taste of what this future rest is going to include for them. Incredible blessing. Every promise that God gave Abraham, Moses, David, and, and each of the prophets, and each of, each of those who, who walked with God and received a word from God for Israel is going to be fulfilled. There is that period of rest that is coming, that period of restoration. And within your life, you have, you have to have that same hope. If you don't have that hope of knowing God's rest is coming, you're gonna you're gonna have that sense that I, I can't make it, I give up. But if you have that understanding that His promises are going to be fulfilled, that His promise to you is going to be fulfilled, at the same time, we also know that God's merciful, and when you're going through things, He gives seasons of refreshing. So even though we're not in that period of rest, that, that millennial kingdom, that place where we're fully enjoying the peace and rest of God, we find even in this horrible wilderness, seasons of rest, uh, an oasis in the desert, a uh, place where he ministers to your spirit, a place where you receive insight from God and revelation to keep you going. If we didn't have that little bit of hope, um, then we need that. If God doesn't remind us that rest is coming, uh, we can get so overoccupied with our current life and the sorrows of this world and the bad government that we think we have and the bad economy we have in our life and uh, conflicts and all kinds of things that we'll be distracted from the fact that His promise is being fulfilled. Nothing has throwing anything off course. God's plan and promises are just where they're supposed to be. The prophecies are pointing us to the fact that that rest is coming. So that's a beautiful, glorious thing. Alright, and we, we know that, that the, the blindness on Israel is a temporary thing. We know that from Romans chapter 11. You know, it tells us that God's not finished with Israel, even though Israel is was off the land and now back on the land, we we can see the promises being fulfilled. But yet we still see blindness on their eyes. The number of of people within the nation of Israel that are atheists, the high level of, of crime in Israel. The fact that Israel is one of the junction points for human trafficking tells me that the blinders are still on. They're doing things objectionable to their God because they can't see Him. They are abandoned by Him and they feel abandoned by Him. But restoration is coming. All right, Hosea 5.15, it's going to be affliction and hardship that's going to remind them who their God is, and point them to His Messiah. And I think that we literally are 